All right, good morning again. So, how many of you, I know this is probably going to be more of a lady's question than a man's question, but how many of you like watching uh, romantic movies? All right, I'm trying to see, oh, there's some guys that have their, their hands up. How many, how many times, uh, ladies, have you ever watched one of those movies and thought, I wish my husband loved me like that? Or men, maybe you were watching the movie to pacify your wife and you thought, I wish my wife treated me like that. Well, quite frankly, the entertainment industry has made billions of dollars depicting and defining what love is. And I'm afraid to say that the way that you and I view what love has probably been more affected by what we watch on television than what we read in Scripture. For example, you and I have been told repeatedly over and over again that you deserve to be happy and your happiness is the most important thing and so do whatever it takes to be happy. We've been told that just as you fall in love, so you can fall out of love. I don't know how many times I've had couples in my office that have said, Pastor Brian, we just don't love each other anymore. We've been told that if your spouse or or partner is not making you happy, then, then you have the right to look elsewhere. If your spouse is just not producing that happiness in you, then, then man, don't stay in an unhappy relationship. We've been told that love is all about getting your needs met. And as long as your needs are being met, then that's what love is. So here's my question this morning. Is that really true, though? I find it very interesting that the, the people, the majority of those who are depicting and defining love for us struggle in their own relationships, do they not? The people that we look to on the big screen as if people who understand what love is have gone through relationship after relationship and marriage after marriage and quite frankly, they don't have their act together, many of them. Could it be that the way that they define love, the way that our society defines love is wrong. As a matter of fact, I would submit to you this morning that there is a huge difference between emotional love and biblical love. There's a huge difference between falling in love, that emotional high that we have whenever we we see somebody, you know, love at first sight and all of those things. There is a huge difference between that feeling and biblical love. So I want to begin reading just a few verses today in Ephesians chapter 5. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ephesians 5. We're going to bounce around today. Ephesians chapter 5, I'm going to read just two verses, and then we'll spend some time in the Old Testament and come back to the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 5, two verses, and this great treatise on marriage in Ephesians 5, Paul makes this statement. I'm just going to read verse 25. Guys, I know it starts before that, but we're going to start here, where Paul says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Would you read that with me today? Let's all read it together. Let's read it together, ready? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Paul concludes that exhortation on marriage in verse 33. Let's read verse 33. Paul says this, however, let each one of you love his wife as himself. And let the wife see that she respects her husband. Would you pray with me today? Father, we we loved you. And we thank you so much that our love for one another has been perfectly exemplified, perfectly lived out in your love for us. So, Lord, I pray that you would help us to examine 
love today. Lord, not only the concept, but even more importantly, Lord, help us to examine how we love each other as husbands, how we love our wives and as wives, how we respond to our husbands. Help us to realize today that love is not an emotion. Yes, there's emotions involved and there needs to be, but true love, biblical love, is a commitment. Help us to see that in your word today, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just so we don't miss out on the truth of these two verses that we just read, it's important for us to remember, or maybe know, that there are basically three words that are translated love in the New Testament. Many of you know this. The first is the Greek word eros, which means physical, sensual, sexual love. That's not the word that Paul uses in Ephesians 5 when he says, husbands, love your wives. The second word is the word phileo, from which we get the name of the city Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Phileo means brotherly love, that that friendship kind of love. That's not the word that Paul uses in Ephesians 5. Now, let me just say that, that every marriage needs to have romance, every marriage needs to be sensual, and every marriage needs to have a friend relationship. But when God commands husbands to love the wives, and when God talks about love in the marriage, those aren't the words that he uses. He uses the word agape, which is a godly love, a love that sacrifices itself for the benefit of someone else. So today, here's what I want to do. I want to, I want to flesh out this concept of love from a biblical point of view. And we're going to look at an Old Testament illustration. We're going to look at a New Testament exhortation. And then we want to look at a modern-day application, and you'll see what I mean by that in just a few moments. So the first is the Old Testament illustration. So if you have your Bibles with you, your phones, turn all the way back to the book of Hosea in the Old Testament. Hosea is a book that we don't speak from or make reference to very often. Hosea was an Old Testament prophet whom God commanded to do something unprecedented, He was a prophet whom God commanded to do something completely unexpected. And it starts out right in the very beginning of the book. So look in Hosea chapter 1 and verse 2. Notice what God commands the prophet, the preacher, Hosea to do. In verse 2, when the Lord began speaking through Hosea, the Lord said, Go marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her. Now, I took that, I believe, from uh, the NIV. Some of the translations are a little bit more direct than that. Some of them say, Hosea, go marry an adulterous woman. Some of them say, Hosea, go marry a whorish woman. But basically, we see that God has commanded his prophet to marry an immoral woman. And so let me pause there and say, don't take your glasses off and clean them. Don't see whether your ears are plugged up. That's exactly what God tells Hosea to do. He commands the prophet to marry an immoral woman. He commands him to marry a prostitute by the name of Gomer. If you've never read through the book of Hosea, I would encourage you to do so. At first in this marriage, everything is fine. In the very first few verses as Hosea begins recounting this, Gomer and Hosea had a child together. They named that child Jezreel. It wasn't long after that, though, that everything seemed to turn south. Everything seemed to fall apart. Because after delivering her first child, Gomer gets pregnant again. But this time, Hosea is not the father. And she gives birth to a girl that she calls Lo Ruama, which they name um, not mercy is basically, or no mercy is what it means. Shortly after that, Gomer gets pregnant a third time. And you know the story, or you probably know the story, or you know where we're going, because this third child, once again, was not Hosea's child. She was pregnant with another child, and it was a boy this time, and they name it No Mercy. Soon, Gomer was gone from the house. She is back to her whorish, Bible word, her whorish, immoral lifestyle. 
Let me just pause for a second because you might be answering or asking the question, Brian, why in the world would God put a story like that in the Bible? I'm not sure we want our kids reading that story. That's like a, you know, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock movie. We don't want our kids reading that. Why would God do that? Well, God put the story in Scripture for two reasons. And as you read through, and actually we'll see in just a moment, but God uses the unfaithfulness of Gomer to illustrate the unfaithfulness of Israel. Because just as Gomer was unfaithful to her husband, so the nation of Israel, so us, we can say, have been unfaithful to God. And he illustrates that. But in this story, God also graciously demonstrates for us how he would act how God would act if he were in a marriage. If God himself was married to an unfaithful wife, if God himself was in the midst of a difficult marriage, how would God respond? We see that illustrated in the book of Hosea. So jump with me now to chapter 2, verses 14 and beyond. Hosea chapter 2, verses 14 and beyond. And beyond. I'll read it from the screen. Do we have it? Hosea chapter 2 and verse 14. So, so in chapter 2, God now has transitioned from the story of Hosea and Gomer, and he's talking about his relationship with Israel, but there's some really cool applications that I want you to see. So God is saying Israel is unfaithful to him, just as Gomer is unfaithful to Hosea, and God says this, therefore, behold, I will allure her. By the way, every husband needs to underline this verse. This is a great verse because God says, here's what I'm going to do to my unfaithful wife. I will allure her. The word allure has the idea of winning her back. He says, I will take her back into the wilderness. The idea is I'm going to take her back to where we first met. And I want to rekindle those emotions, those feelings that we had when we first met. Hey, guys, have you ever gone through a rough patch in your marriage? That's a great thing to do. Treat your wife as you did when you were first dating. Can I get an amen from the wives? All right. Amen from Vicky. Vicky's saying, yeah, that's great, Brian. When are you going to take me out to eat, right? <laughs> verse, verse 15. Hey, hey, Vicky, we're going to stop by McDonald's on the way home today. <laughs> That's what we did when we first started dating, was it not? Huh? Verse 15, and there I will give her vineyards and make the valley of Achor a door of hope, and there she shall answer as in the days of her youth. At the time when she came out of the land of Egypt, God is talking about winning her back. And in that day declares the Lord, you will no longer call me my husband, or, or, or excuse me, you will call me my husband, and no longer will you call me my Baal. Verse 17, for I will remove the names of the Baals from her mouth, and they shall be remembered by name no more. Verse 18, for I will make for them a covenant on that day with the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, the creatures things to the ground, and I will abolish the bow, the sword, and war from the land, and I will make you lie down in safety. Verse 19, see this verse, and I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love. If you underline in your Bibles, underline that phrase, in steadfast love and in mercy. Verse 20, and I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So see, here's what, here's what the story is saying. In spite of Israel's unfaithfulness, God is faithful. And God takes her back. And God recommits himself to his bride forever. Now, let me give you a couple of practical applications because we want to be extremely practical today. And by the way, we've told you that this series is going to apply to you whether you're married or whether you're single. And the story of God's unforgiving, unrelenting love for you applies whether you're married or whether you're single. And as we said in the very beginning of this series, just as a husband chases after his wife, there's a God in heaven who is chasing after you with all of his passion, with all of his emotion, with all of his desire, and he desires to recommit. You might say, Brian, I've been unfaithful to him. I've run away from him. I've been, uh, I've been um, completely how I shouldn't be. Well, well, don't worry. God is chasing after you, and God is alluring you. And God wants to take you back in the wilderness, and God wants to restore that relationship with you. But here's a couple of practical applications we can draw from the passage. The first is this. Like Hosea, your spouse has hurt you. 
You said, Brian, how do you know what's been going on in our marriage? <laughs> like Hosea, your spouse has hurt you. All of us can relate to that truth. Now, most probably your wife, your husband, has not been unfaithful to you as Gomer was unfaithful to Hosea. But I'm pretty confident your wife has been unkind to you, men. Ladies, I'm pretty confident your husband has had wandering eyes at times. Men, I'm pretty confident there's been some time in your life when your wife has disrespected you. Ladies, I know there's been times that your husband has failed to love you the way that you want, the way that you deserve to be loved. The simple truth today is this. All of us have been hurt by our spouse. As a matter of fact, you might be here today hurting. Why is it that there's more arguments that take place on the way to church than any other time during the week? I'm not sure why that is. I'm confident that you've been hurt by your husband or from your wife. From a human perspective, all of us have reason. We have excuse to pack our suitcase. We have excuse to walk out of the relationship and never look back. Here's what I want you to see, though. That is not love. If that's the way that you are responding to the failings and the failures of your spouse, that is not love. As a matter of fact, we can see from Scripture today that that is the very antithesis of love. God loves us not because of our faithfulness. God loves us in spite of our unfaithfulness. And that's the way God commands us to love our spouses. The second truth that I put in your notes is this. Like Hosea, God prompts you to love your spouse in spite of his or her failings. I mean, can you imagine how Hosea was hurt? I mean, he had taken a step of faith. God had told him to marry this immoral woman, and he did what wasn't comfortable for him, and he reached out and married this lady, and he wanted to make it work, and all of a sudden, she betrayed him. Not once, but at least twice. And then she walks out the door. I'm sure maybe in Hosea's mind, there was a place that he thought, man, good riddance. <laughs> That's not the type of relationship that I want to be in. It hurts too much. But notice God's command to Hosea in chapter 3 and verse 1. Because God comes to Hosea again, and the Lord God said to me, Go again, Hosea. Love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel. God is saying, Hosea, I know you've been hurt. Hosea, I know that she has been unfaithful to you. But Hosea, here's what I want you to do. I want you to demonstrate a different type of love. A love at this moment that is not based upon emotion, but a love at this moment that is based upon commitment. And I want you to go and love her. You might not feel it. You might not emotionally be attached at this moment. The passion might be gone. But Hosea, I want you to make a commitment to this woman, even though she has been unfaithful to you. The third thing that I wrote in my notes, and it's here in the passage, is this. Like God, you and I are to love with a steadfast, loyal love. A few moments ago, we read chapter two and verse 19. I think we can put that back up on the screen again. And the Lord tells Israel, I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice and in, catch this phrase, steadfast love. Probably the most important word in the Hebrew Old Testament. It's the word hesed. It's found 246 times in the Old Testament. It's a concept that the translators had difficulty translating because as you take your English Bibles now, this word is translated a variety of ways. It's translated loving kindness. It's translated mercy. It's translated steadfast love. It's translated loyal love. So, so when God looks at Israel and God looks at you and me and God commands Gomer, or excuse me, Hosea to look at Gomer, he says, listen, I, I'm not commanding you to love her with a passionate, emotional, eros, phileo type of love. I'm commanding you to demonstrate a committed, steadfast, loyal love. 
Man, I'd, I'd encourage you. Maybe we'll put it up on the website. I'd encourage you to read all the verses that that's found in the Old Testament because every time we read that, the, uh, a verse that that word is found in, we see God demonstrating his faithful, unconditional love for you and for me. It is so beautiful. Aren't you glad today that if you've blown it, God still loves you? Aren't you glad today that, that, man, if you just completely went off the deep end, God doesn't say, that's it, I'm done, I don't want you back, but God demonstrates to you a hased, a steadfast, loyal, loving kindness type of love. And here in Hosea, we find that that is the type of love that God desires for marriage, for my marriage and for your marriage. A steadfast love that is undeserved. A steadfast love that is freely given, whether it is reciprocated or not. That's the way God loves us. By the way, God loves you when you love him, and God loves you when you don't love him. God loves you when you seek him, and God loves you when you don't seek him. God loves you whether you reciprocate his love or God loves you whether you don't reciprocate his love. God loves you with a steadfast, loyal love. That's the type of love that we need to demonstrate in our marriages. It's not capricious. It's not something that can be easily lost. As a matter of fact, it's not an emotion. It is a commitment it is a covenant. It is a promise to endure no matter what happens. An Old Testament illustration. Go with me to the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Because as we try to describe love, we not only see an Old Testament illustration, but we also see a New Testament exhortation. 1 Corinthians 13 is arguably the greatest chapter on love in the entire Bible. For time's sake, we won't take the time to read this chapter, but I would highly encourage you to go home and read this chapter. It is a literary masterpiece, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's God's illustration, and it's God's definition of love. In the first three verses, God tells us what love isn't. <laughs> Love isn't some big emotional display, gongs and drums and cymbals and flowers and fancy events. God says, that's not what real love is. As he gets to verse four, he begins to pound out in a nitty gritty fashion what love is. So, so I'm, gonna, uh, I'm just gonna take the time today and read through these verses. And I want to read through them slowly today because I want to ask you to examine the way you love with the way God loves and the way God encourages us to love. 1 Corinthians 13, beginning in verse 4, Paul says this, love is patient. Let me pause there for a second. The word patient means long-tempered. It literally means a love that puts up with a lot. This word speaks of a person who has been taken advantage of over and over and over again, but doesn't get angry. When their spouse takes advantage of them, they're patient with him or her. Love is patient. Love is kind. The word kind or kindness there means active goodwill. Love doesn't envy. Love doesn't boast. Love is not arrogant. It's not rude. I love this one. It doesn't insist on its own way. Boy, that kind of goes against our culture, is it not? Countercultural, because you remember we're told that love is about you getting your needs met. And Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said, no, 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 no. Love is not about you insisting on your own way. Remember a few weeks ago, we were in Philippians chapter 2, and we talked about live generously, and we talked about verse 4 that says, you know, don't look to your own interests, but look to the interests of others. That's exactly how he's describing it here. 
Love does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable, irritable or resentful. The word resentful is huge. The word resentful is an accounting term. It has the idea of keeping score. You ever do that in your marriage? Ah, okay, you did that to me once. I'm putting it right over there. If you ever do it to me again, I'm going to go back and I'm going to put another one right there. And we all can sit back and look at our spouse and say, you've done that to me five times, or you've done that to me ten times, or you've done that to me. How do we know how many times they've done it? We're keeping count, all right? We, we have a ledger in our mind, and we're keeping count. Paul says, that's not real love. Love is not resentful. Love does not keep score. It's not resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Bears all things. Believes all things. Love is not cynical. Love is not suspicious. Love, love is a mutual trust between one and the other. That's why when that trust is broken, it's so difficult to rebuild that trust because love is a mutual trust. Bears all things. Believes all things. Hey, hey, if you're in a difficult marriage today, underline this phrase, hopes all things. I love that. True love never loses hope. As long as God's grace is still operative, what do we mean by that? As long as God is at work, human failure is not final. Oh, that's so important. I meet with couples all the time, and, and they come in, and, and uh, Brian, you have no idea what my spouse has done to me. Brian, you have no idea what I have been put through. Nobody in their right mind could go through what I have gone through. Paul says, don't lose hope. God's grace is still operative. The gospel still has power. The gospel still can change and transform marriage. God didn't take Israel's failure as final. Jesus didn't take Peter's failure as final. Paul didn't take the Corinthians' failure as final. They loved with hope. So here's what I want you to see in your notes, if you're following along in your notes. Love is not an emotion. Love is not an emotion. Yes, there's emotion involved in it. Yeah, when I'm gone and I come home and I see my wife, my, my heart skips a beat. I get all of that. But love is not an emotion. It is a series of actions that demonstrate your commitment to your spouse. Catch that. It is so important. It is a series of actions in which you demonstrate your commitment to your spouse. As I mentioned, there's days that you might not like each other. There's days that it might be difficult to carry on a civil conversation. I get that. But in the midst of all of that, what do you do? What do I do? We continue with those series of divine actions which demonstrate our commitment to one another. And I promise you, if you do that, guess what happens? The emotion comes back. The passion comes back. The relationship comes back. Love is not an emotion, but it's a series of actions that demonstrate your commitment. Um, husbands, wives, here's what I'd encourage you to do. I'd encourage you to take these verses and use them as a checklist to examine the way that you love your spouse. Where are you failing? I'm sure as I read through that list, there was a little bit of conviction on one or two of those. Where do you need to improve? Ask the Holy Spirit of God to help you produce this type of love in your heart and also in your actions. Verse seven ends with this phrase, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. The word endure there is a military term. It is such a, a cool word. It was a military term used of an army holding on to a vital position at all costs. And so this army had a hill or a fortress, and they surrounded this hill or the fortress, and they defended it at all costs. 
They endured, if necessary, to the very end. Every hardship, every assault was to be endured in order to hold fast. (laughs) Paul says that's what love is. Love endures all things. And then it says love never ends. It never ends. It's continuous. Love holds fast to those it loves. It endures all things at all costs. It stands up against overwhelming opposition and refuses to stop bearing, stop believing, stop loving, because true love will never stop loving. So today we've seen an Old Testament illustration of Hosea and Gomer. We've seen a New Testament exhortation. So today we want to be extremely practical. I want to give you a modern day application today. So I'm going to ask Matt and Betty Sinelli if they would come up to the platform. Many of you know Matt and Betty. Let's give them a hand, Matt and Betty. (laughs) Matt and Betty are are a wonderful couple in our church. Wonderful couple in our church. Matter of fact, if you looked at Matt and Betty, you would say, oh my word, they have it all together. Why, this is the perfect marriage, huh? But Matt and Betty have gone through struggles just like you and I have gone through struggles and God has done a work of grace and a miracle in their marriage. I'm gonna let them tell you their story, Matt and Betty. Well, we do have the perfect marriage. Good night. (laughs) No. No, uh, I'm just, I'm here for the brownie points, um, so, and I hope I can cash out later, uh, as long as I don't say anything stupid in the next 10 minutes. Um, what's up with that? Like, you, like you lose everything if you say something dumb. Uh, but no, we, uh, we don't have the perfect marriage. In fact, um, Betty and I have been married for eight years, um, and Pastor Brian, in Pastor Brian's words, uh, in eight years, uh, we have gone through things that most couples don't go through. And so the fact that we're still together is only by Jesus Christ. Um, and so we're up here because we just wanted to share a practical application of what it is about commitment and, um, and hope to encourage you guys. So um, I'm going to let Betty go first and, and kind of expand on that. So I have to admit that when I first heard that Pastor wanted us to share, I thought, what did we do to him? Um, <laughs> why, why is this happening? Um, until I heard that the message was going to be on commitment. Um, because it reminded me of the work that the Lord has done in my heart in the area of commitment. See, before um, we got married, I was married once before, and I got married real young, and um, I just thought it would be like Disney. I don't know what I was thinking, but two years into the marriage, after a conflict, um, I walked out. I walked out of the marriage and thought I would never return, um, but I did to try to work things out, and uh, we went, went through counseling, but to be honest with you, even through counseling, I had one foot out the door. Um, I had made a promise, and I broke it, and um, it was during the season when um, I was pursuing divorce that the Lord just really revealed himself to me and made himself real to me, and I saw my need for him, and he was so gracious and merciful, and uh, he was pursuing me, just like Pastor was, was talking about um, before. And um, it was during this time that I met Matt, Prince Charming. <laughs> and it was the last thing I wanted to do was to meet somebody who had just um, ended a marriage. Like, the last thing you want to do is meet somebody else, or at least that's the case for me. Um, at the same time during this whole season was happening, I had really lost all hope for marriage. And I, I'm not exaggerating. Like, I remember a time... I was on the phone with with my very good friend, and I just kept repeating, I've lost all hope for marriage. I've lost all hope for marriage. And I remember her saying, wow, you're getting attacked. And I thought, yes, I am, but I don't know how to get out of this. And um, what what got me out of it was one word, and that word was trust. Um, It kept on coming up as I kept seeking the Lord. It kept on coming up in my Bible study, trust. It kept on coming up in my devotions, trust. It kept on coming up in... um, the Christian radio station trust, and I thought, but I'm trying to trust Matt with my heart, and the more I try to place my trust in him, the more insecure I feel, this is just not gonna work. Um, And I realized, or or really God revealed to me that my trust really needed to be in the Lord first. I needed to trust God so much, and it needed to be so full that then it would overflow onto Matt, and that's what happened 
making it possible for me to say I do on November 21st, 2009, until the Lord takes us home. Um, I can tell you there is a world of difference, a world of difference between a godless marriage and one where Christ is at the center of it. Night and day difference. Um, we don't have a perfect marriage, but I can tell you that 80 or 90% of our marriage is amazing. I mean, this is a man of God. I love him so much. I deeply admire him. He's not perfect, of course, neither am I, but the majority of our marriage has been amazing. The 20% that has been difficult, um, a struggle, challenging, and sometimes heartbreaking, I'll be honest with you, was worse or has been worse than anything I experienced in my first marriage. But not once in the last eight years have I thought of divorce, and that's the Lord. Like, that is not Amen. me, I'm telling you. So it just, I'm thankful for Miss Vicki and Pastor for inviting us to share because it has reminded me of the work that God has done in my life in the area of commitment, um, something that I had completely forgotten about. Thank you. Um, I'm going to share a quote with you um, from C.S. Lewis. This is one of my favorite quotes. It says, um, aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you'll get neither. And so aiming for earth has um, the connotation of aiming at what the earth says about commitment. Commitment is really, it's not about commitment. It's about what feels right. Um, the problem with this is, is that um, there's no trust there. Um, you know, in commitment, when something happens, trust is broken. And I'm sure a lot of you experience that in your marriages where trust has been broken. How can you commit if there's no trust? Um, so I guess the question I would ask you guys is where is your trust found in your marriage, in your relationships? Where is your trust found? Uh, what issue are you holding on to so tight that is causing your trust in God to fail? Um, is this something that's on this earth? Um, I'm going to read you Psalm 37 5. It's a really cool verse. It says, Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him, and He will act. Uh, so Proverbs 16 20. Whoever gives thought to the Word will discover good, and blessed is he who trusts in the Lord. Um, and so I think the problem that I went through in my marriage in the beginning was I didn't have the right target for trust. I would trust her, trust that in her, our marriage would be secure. And I totally missed the mark, because I'm supposed to trust in the Lord, and then that gets heaven and earth out of the deal. Um, for, those that are, for those of you that are married, um, some recommendations, because I'm terrible at advice. Um, recommendations would be talk to God and spouse about your trust issues. Um, a lot of the problems that we see that, you know, when we talk to couples is that they don't even talk to each other. And so talk about it. I know it hurts, but talk about it. Seek help. Uh, don't stay private in your struggles. You know, don't, don't be the prisoner of your own mind and let your mind rot you out. Talk to somebody. Find somebody at church that you trust, somebody that knows the Lord. Uh, Betty and I are always open to talk to you guys, you know, about it. Um, don't stay private with that. Uh, realign your focus. Don't trust your spouse. <laughs> trust God. But in the end, when you trust God, you can trust your spouse. It, it, it's, it's kind of a weird way of looking at it, but it does work. Uh, for those of you that are not married, maybe those of you that are living together, uh, recommendation would be find blessing in the commitment of marriage. You know, we just read uh, Proverbs 16, 20, that only blessing comes if you trust in God and trust in his plan of commitment for marriage. So I challenge you guys to step out of the woodwork uh, March 10th, they're having that massive ceremony. Do it, you know, jump on board. If you need a best man, I'll be your best man. You know, if you want me to be your DJ, I could be your DJ. You know, I know we're in a Baptist church, we're not supposed to dance, but... <laughs> but Pastor Jose was salsa dancing. That's so right, that, that's right. So we're good now. No, I'm just um, and uh, the last thing I will say is this. Um, Betty and I know that you guys are struggling in your marriage. Um, we have prayed for you this morning before we came here. We were on our knees praying for you guys. Um, trust him. Trust him. And don't stay private. Come out. Find somebody you trust. Um, men, hold the line. Don't give up. Um, I love what Pastor Brian just said about endure. Hold the line, guys. 
Ladies, don't give up hope. Um, I'm a basket case of a husband, and she hoped that God would change me, and he has, and he is continuing to do so. Thank you. Hold on a minute. So I appreciate so much you guys' willingness to show your heart and your testimony. Let me ask you a couple follow-up questions. Can I? All right, so, so we know each other really well, and so I know, Matt, there's been times that you've done some things that not only have hurt Betty, but maybe even caused her to lose respect for you. So Betty, when that happens, how do you get, because, because Paul says in Ephesians 5, and wives see that you respect your husband. So when your husband does something, which we all do, that causes you to lose respect for him, how do you get that respect back? Prayer is so key. Um, and my identity is found in the Lord, so that's really key. Uh, I cannot find my security in that. Um, it helps that when he confesses, or when he's confessed in our marriage, um, it, I've seen him be repentant. I mean, you know, he's repentant. Um, so anytime that he's hurt me or, um, you know, he's, he's felt bad about it, he's confessed it. But, you know, I think the best way that I can put it, there was a, a period of time where, um, you know, and I'll, I'll let him share his own testimony if that feels my place too, but, you know, there were times where I felt certainly um, just heartbroken in our marriage, and he would confess um, things to me that I felt were very hard to forgive. And um, after you go through that a few times, I mean, there was a point where I thought if, if one more confession comes my way, like I may just vomit. Um, but <laughs> but uh, it was the confession <laughs> after that that as he said, will you forgive me? The Lord just opened my eyes and revealed to me just how much I have been forgiven of. Yeah. Amen. And, and who am I? Like literally the words I heard that come out, I don't think they were for me, but the words came out. Who am I to withhold forgiveness after the Lord has been so good and gracious and merciful to me? And I had a real breakthrough. It was more of a breakthrough, breakdown, together mix. Um, but ever since then, and, and also, I just want to say, the Lord, you know, we don't have the time to go into details, but the Lord has done an amazing work in my husband's life. Um, what I'm sharing with you about these confessions started when we were dating, and I have seen the power of the Lord. There is power in the name of Jesus. So whatever you're struggling with, it doesn't matter if it has to do with marriage or not. There is power in the name of Jesus. Amen. I am witness to it. Amen. Amen. That's excellent. So first of all, Betty, I... There's got to be a crown in heaven for being married to Matt, I would think. I, I would think. We know that. So, so, Matt, one last question, and then we'll draw to a close today, because we all know what it's like to be in a relationship where all of a sudden there's days that you feel like oil and water, right? Where, where, where everything you say is not correct, and everything that she says kind of is abrasive and rubs on you, and it's difficult as a husband to love our wife on those days. So on those days, those few days when Betty does something that maybe could aggravate you, how do you love her in spite of that? What, what, what is it that happens internally in you to make you respond correctly instead of incorrectly on those days? Um, yeah, I, uh, we have this thing in the love and respect classes we talk about. It's called stop, drop, and pray. Uh, you know, if you guys are on fire, what do you do? You stop, drop, and roll. Everybody knows that. Um, in our marriage, we have a thing where we stop, drop, and pray. Um, the most spiritually mature person in the relationship will go to prayer first together. I'm not talking about pray separately. I'm talking about, honey, can we pray together now? Um, uh, there have been times, uh, probably about 80% of the time, Betty's the one <laughs> to pray first, you know, because I'm just a man and I have like a thousand you know, milligrams of testosterone in my body and I, you know, just want my way. Uh, but yeah, pray, you know, if you guys are in conflict, you know, in love and respect, we talk about how uh, when the wife is not loved, she will disrespect the husband. And when the husband is disrespected, he doesn't love the wife. And you're just with this called the, the cyclical crazy, crazy cycle. cycle. Mm -hmm. And so to stop that cycle from happening is to pray. And, and, and whoever prays, I would just encourage you to just confess your sin in front of your spouse because let's face it, we're all broke as a joke um, and we need Jesus. So, you know, just start with you and I'm telling you, the walls will come tumbling down and your spouse will confess too. And it's amazing. It's like, what just happened? You know, 
So um, pray. You know, if you guys only pray for dinner and lunch, um, I would encourage you guys. Um, we, we didn't really incorporate prayer a lot in the beginning of our relationship, uh, in our marriage. I would say until the last probably of like th- uh, four to five years, we started praying more. And we're like, wow, this actually works. <laughs> it's amazing. It's in the Bible, you know. But, yeah, definitely pray. Pray during that crazy cycle and watch the enemy lose. Amen. Let's give them a hand today. Thank you so much. I love your transparency. Thank you. Ready? So here's the question. The question is, where are you in your relationship today? And here's what I'd ask you to do today. As Stephen and the team come, would you allow the Holy Spirit of God to do a work in your heart? Because here's what I know. I know that God wants us to have marriages not perfect, but marriages that, that, that illustrate the gospel. And guys, I know that God wants us to love our wives just as Jesus loved the church. And wives, I know that God wants you to respond to your husbands and respect your husbands just as we as a church respond and respect Jesus, our Savior. So what is God speaking to you about today? If you're struggling in your marriage, we want you to know there is hope in Jesus Christ. You might say, Brian, I can't stand another day of him. Yes, you can. There's hope in Christ. And by the way, we're here to help you, all of us pastors, myself, Pastor Brad, Pastor Jose, we all do marital counseling on a regular basis. If you're beyond us, we have counselors that we can send you to. We desire to help you. If you're here today and you're not married, you're living together, here's our desire. We want you to have a relationship that honors God. And a relationship that you can sit back and say, boy, our relationship, the way we're living, the way we demonstrate ourselves publicly is a reflection of the gospel. We want to help you with that. Maybe you're here today and you went through an unbelievably difficult divorce and you're hurting, you're broken. I get it. And we'd love to love you through that and encourage you through that. Maybe you're here today and you say, Brian, been there, done that, got the t-shirt, I'm single for the rest of my life. I get it, I get it. But even in your singleness, you can love others the way that Christ has loved us. And so would you stand with me? I'm gonna have a word of prayer and, and Stephen's gonna lead us, his team's gonna lead us in worship. Would you just allow the Holy Spirit of God to speak to you today? If your marriage needs restored, realize that there's hope for restored, renewed marriage. If you need Jesus Christ today, you're here and there's never been a time in your life when you have by faith repented of your sin and turned yourself to him today, turn to Jesus. If we can pray with you, we'll have some of our leaders and our our elders and our deacons down front. We'd love to have the opportunity to do that. Take a step of faith, pray with your spouse, allow the Holy Spirit of God to use the gospel in your marriage.